Now let's see another example of writing IAM policies. How to grant access to an Amazon S3 bucket. Here we see we have two statements within the policy. As I have already mentioned here, we have two different ARNs to specify bucket level permissions and object level permissions. Now let's see the first statement. Here the effect is allow. The action is S3 colon list objects for the resources that is ARN as ARN colon AWS S3 test. It means that we allow a list object operation on the test bucket. So the name of the bucket is test and we are allowing list object operation. The first resource element specifies ARN AWS S3 test for the list objects so that applications can list all objects in the test bucket. So this is clear. Let's see the second one. The second resource element specifies uh, AWS uh, S3 test slash tar for get object, put object, delete object actions so that applications can read, write and delete any object in the test bucket. Here as well, the effect is allow, which means that it can allow or it's an allow operation on the resource test slash tar. So here you would ask me, why have we divided these into two parts? We could have written all the operations for both bucket level and object level permissions like test star and we could have minimized the code and even though it is a valid question let's see why we have written it like this if you see the first statement here it precisely specifies allow permission for the list object and this returns some or all up to 1000 of the objects in a bucket so that's basically to list the objects but still we did not combine the two ARNs by using a wildcard such as test star because even though this ARN would grant permission for all actions in a single statement, it is broader and grants access to any bucket and object in that bucket that begins with test like test bucket or testing because we are using a wildcard that is test star. And that is why if you write test star, this policy would apply to any bucket that start with test like testing, test world, test dev, tested, testify and so on. And this example might sound stupid right now, but let's suppose you make this small error and eventually you will end up missing the data that you wish to collect. Or if suppose in any case, if you apply this and you accidentally apply a delete using this policy, you might be aware of what might happen next. Now that you're aware of this, let's see how it actually looks like in real time. Let's read this statement again so that it gets imprinted in our head. So what is AWS IAM? AWS Identity and Access Management or IAM is a web service that helps you securely control access to your AWS resources. When a principal actually makes a request in AWS, the AWS enforcement code checks whether the principal is authenticated. Authenticated means whether it is signed in. And also it checks if it is authorized, which means if it has permissions or not. So I hope this is clear to all by now. Let's suppose this is your account and this is your principal. And as I already told you, it can be a user, a role, a federated user, or even an application that is sending a request to use the resources in your account. And when a principal makes a request in AWS, the AWS enforcement code checks whether the principal is authenticated and authorized. And you manage access in AWS by creating policies and attaching them to IAM identities or AWS resources. And these policies when attached to an identity or resource define their permission. These could be either identity based policies or resource based policies or other roles or account based policies. And it's not that only users or principal should belong to the same account. It could also be from a different account as well, or they can be from different accounts as well. For example, you're working on a deployment and as a cloud engineer, you want to perform an update on an account that belongs to another in-house team. So you can do that by using an assume role feature. And from your account itself, you can access resources in another account. And when the principal makes the request, and upon authentication and authorization, it is allowed to perform operations via actions that is from console or operations like using API calls or CLI commands. Similarly, like we do, like creating an S3 bucket, starting an instance or stopping it or terminating it. This is only done possible or it is only possible when you have 
sufficient authentication and authorization. Now let's see when you write the policy, how does the evaluation logic actually work? So here is the evaluation logic for a request within a single account. First and foremost, by default, all requests are implicitly denied. And if you don't have a policy attached, it means you don't have access. So it's simple. By default, all the requests are denied, implicitly denied. Remember, you need to understand the difference between implicit and explicit. I know you are programmers or you have written programs or uh, you have done coding in your life and you know what is the implicit declaration and what is the explicit declaration. So, so we must always remember that all requests are implicitly denied. Moving on to the next one, an explicit allow in an identity based or resource based policy overrides this default. So when you attach a policy that has an explicit or definite allow effect, then and only then you are allowed to access the resource and thus it overrides the default state of denial. And that is what I already explained, like all requests are implicitly denied, but if you add an explicit allow, then and only then the request will be allowed to access the resource. Next is if a permission boundary organizational SAP or session policy is present, it might override the allow with an implicit deny. For example, when you're working in a larger organization that has more than 100 or 150 accounts, the master account might use SCP or service control policies to enforce certain restrictions on the accounts under its umbrella. For example, it might say that all sessions should last only for one hour or all IAM create user or tag user operations are denied. In that case, it will override all the implicit allows. The last one that we have here is an explicit deny in any policy overrides any allow. As I already told you, there might be multiple statements or multiple policies attached to a particular request. In that case, as AWS performs a logical OR operation, and if one of them also has explicit deny, the request will be denied. This is interesting because let's suppose you have five policies for the resource and out of them, if one has an explicit deny, then it will override all the allows. Understanding this carefully, during authorization, the AWS enforcement code actually uses values from the request context to check for matching policies and determines whether to allow or deny the request. And IAM authorizes your request only if every part of your request is allowed by the applicable policies. And if a single policy denies the request, AWS denies the entire request and stops evaluating policies. This is called an explicit deny. So I hope you understand the difference between implicit and explicit. That is why I said implicit deny will also be a problem because if you don't have explicit allow, then you don't have the permission. If you have an explicit deny, then you will be denied permission. So understand these points very carefully. By default, all the requests are denied. Even though you don't have a deny or allow or any policy attached, it means that it is implicitly denied. I'll give you a very simple example. There is a door that you can see in your house. Let's suppose there is a door or any place that you go, there is a door and it is written that names written on the door are only allowed access. If there are five names written on that and your name is not present, then you are implicitly denied access because your name is not there. And on the other hand, if there is a board that actually tells these people should not be allowed and in that your name is there, then it is a explicit deny. I hope you got the point. And if you still have doubts, let's see this example. Let's understand the permission with a real time use case, which is a real life use case. Let's suppose this is the user and this is the office space. And this user by default has no access to the office premises. So what we can do? Let's add our first policy. User allow access the office. This will allow full access to the office like this because it has the permission, because we are granting the permission by using a policy that is user allow access to the whole office. So the user has full access to the office now. Now let's add another policy. User deny access the office. So this policy has an explicit deny. It will deny all access to the office like this. Now let's remove these two policies and add a new policy. Now this policy has a custom access to the user for the CEO cabin and the breakout area. Now you can see 
the user has access to only the CEO cabin and breakout area because it has an explicit allow for only the CEO cabin and the breakout area. Moving on, let's remove this as well and add a new multi-set policy. Now let's see the access permissions for the user. Oh well, all the access is denied now. But we still see allow policies in the statement. That is because an explicit deny in any policy overrides any allows. And the same thing happens with IAM and the access to the resources in AWS. So we hope you got the point.